While British and Japanese troops battled it out on the ground in Malaya in December and January 1941, an equally important battle was taking place in the skies above. Both sides in the conflict knew that the air battle over Malaya would be incredibly important. As I've mentioned elsewhere, the British built a large network of air bases across northern and central Malaya, hoping to disrupt the Japanese invasion before it landed and dominate the skies over the combat zones. But it didn't quite happen like that. The RAF forces in Malaya in December 1941 were under strength, numbering only a little over 200 aircraft. And these weren't the first line units that were fighting in other theatres. Across the board, the RAF planes here were inferior to their Japanese counterparts, and the Japanese pilots had much more combat experience too. It was though the RAF that struck the first blow in the air, with Hudson bombers from No. 1 Squadron Royal Australian Air Force attacking the Japanese landing craft off Kota Baru in the early hours of December 8th. They were joined later by Blenheim and Wildebeest bombers from six other squadrons for a total of 86 bombers, sinking one ship and damaging two others. On Japan's side, Imperial Japanese Army planes began to attack RAF airfields from the early morning, while also trying to get aircraft moved to airbases on Malaya as quickly as possible. The British tried to disrupt this with their own bombing raids. On December 9th, six Blenheims attacked Singora airfield, but they lacked fighter escort and three were shot down after being intercepted by 30 Japanese fighters. The RAF plotted a follow-up attack, but before they could do so, two squadrons of Blenheims were attacked on the ground at Butterworth airfield and all but one destroyed. It was a terrible start for the RAF who could not cope with the Japanese air forces. When the invasion began there were 110 operational British aircraft deployed in northern Malaya. By the end of the first day this number was 50. By the end of day 2 this number had dropped to just 10, all of which were at the same airbase. It was a catastrophe. The British early warning system and airbase anti-air protection was shown up as wholly inadequate. Air Marshal Pulford, heading up the RAF in Malaya, cut his losses. All but two fighter squadrons were pulled back to Singapore and six airbases were abandoned, including Alor Star, near to where the Indian 11th Division was still hoping to hold the Japanese back at Jitra. The priority for Pulford now was to give some measure of protection to Singapore itself and to the convoys bringing reinforcements to Malaya, so the vast majority of fighters would be retained in the south going forwards. This obviously meant there wouldn't be enough fighters to escort any bombing missions, which meant the few remaining ground attack aircraft had to be restricted to nighttime operations with no close air support during the day. The rest of December was a struggle with outnumbered Allied fighters doing their best against more numerous and superior Japanese aircraft. The ground armies were forced back and the RAF was powerless to prevent the terror bombing of Penang Island in mid-December that killed more than 5,000 civilians. Ironically though, the Japanese focus on using its bombers to try and damage civilian morale took pressure off the British and Commonwealth ground forces during their long retreat south. In mid-January, the fighting moved into the most southern Malayan state of Johor, which began to work in the Allies' favour, at least in the air. There were shorter flight times from the airfield on Singapore Island itself, and the Allies were now aided by Dutch Glen Martin bombers flying from Sumatra, and American B-24s from Java. It was welcome, but not enough to turn the tide, not least because the RAF was running out of aircraft and it was proving a nightmare to get reinforcements into Singapore. The easiest way to get planes into a theater was simply to fly them in, but this became more and more difficult as airfields were lost. The short range of fighters meant that they could not fly in from India once a key staging airbase in Burma was lost during the invasion. This meant that any fresh fighters would either have to arrive inside a ship or be flown off the deck of an aircraft carrier. Both were used. 51 Hurricanes arrived in Singapore packed inside crates on January 13th, with 48 more being flown off HMS Indomitable to Sumatra and then Singapore later in the month. It had taken a long time for these planes to arrive though. By the time they were in the skies over Malaya, Japanese troops were virtually on Singapore's doorstep. It was hoped that the more modern Hurricanes could swing the balance in the air, and indeed they were a marked improvement on the Buffalo fighters, but they were still crucially inferior to the Japanese Zero fighter 
and only about equivalent in capability to the Ki-43, and there were a lot more Japanese fighters available. Between 15th and 24th of January, the Allies had around 74 bombers and 27 fighters operational at any one time. Japan had 150 fighters and 250 bombers. It was a massive advantage, even after the Hurricanes were pressed into service. It wasn't for nothing though. The Hurricanes did allow the Aria to deny Japan some level of air superiority, limiting the number of amphibious landings in Johor and helping to secure the flanks of the troops retreating there. It was very much a retreat though, and by the fourth week in January, all remaining planes were being pulled back to Singapore Island and the bombers were sent to be based off Sumatra. The ground troops soon joined the RAF on the island, and on the last day of January, the siege of Singapore began. <laughs> 